Go ahead and grab your Bible, turn your Bible on and find Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, if you are new or newer to Hope Church, we have over the last few months been walking through the book of Exodus and we find ourselves almost right in the middle of this story of God's redemption. And I hope that you've been encouraged so far in our study and uh, you know, God's word is given to us uh, to really show us our need and then as even I prayed earlier, to show us the only solution, Jesus Christ. And so we believe that both the Old and New Testament focus uh, our attention on one grand story. Uh, You could say it this way, the Old Testament points us to Christ, the Gospels reveal to us who Jesus Christ was and is, and the letters explain to us Jesus. And so all of it has relevance, and I hope that in our study to this point that you've been encouraged and been helped, uh, maybe even provoked if you're an unbeliever, to think about both the power and the presence of Jesus Christ Uh, and how that uh, works itself out. And so we're going to look at the first 11 verses, and we come to what is typically known as the Ten Commandments, that even if you uh, are, um, you don't have a long track record in the life of the church, this is probably not new to you, at least the term itself, the the Ten Commandments. And so we're going to take this Sunday and next Sunday and seek to unpack these beautiful words that have contemporary relevance. Uh, One of the things that I would suggest to you is that Uh, and you're going to see this in the first part of this, is that we have to understand how important it is that grace precedes demands. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But let's offer just another short prayer and ask God to visit with us as we open his word together. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Uh, God, we don't move from worship to something else now. We get the privilege as your people to worship in and through your word. And so God, I pray that you would give us deep longings uh, to not only to know how to articulate really beautiful things. But God, I pray that we would be gripped by beautiful things this morning, that your church would come alive to, uh, Lord, what you have for us, and that we would see the beauty of obedience and what it, what it means. And then, God, I pray that you would show us ourself this morning as we study your word. God, that you would then show us our Savior and that we would respond in glad-hearted obedience. That's our prayer this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at these verses, here's my aim. As I've been thinking about this actually over the last two weeks, uh, what, what is a good sort of opening to think about when we open these verses together, when we think about this text, when we think about really the centrality of this in the life of a Christian, this I think is a, an appropriate aim, and maybe if you're taking notes this would help you, is that we would love God supremely. That we would love God supremely. Adolf Hitler once said that the Ten Commandments have lost their validity. Conscience is a Jewish invention, he went on to say. It is a blemish like circumcision. I would say that we reject this assertion outright. Instead, we believe that Jesus was correct when he spoke these words. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. When we look at these verses, what we find is not just some arbitrary demands that are given from some killjoy, but we actually find contained within the Ten Commandments how it is that we are to love God clearly and how it is that we are to love one another. You could boil down, really, these next verses into giving God's people direction on not how to be set free from bondage, because you have to remember these folks have already been set free. God at Mount Sinai gives them really specific instructions on how they are to live out their redemption. And so rather than coming to this text, which many have taught that if you'll just obey these, then you'll be free, I would suggest to you that because you are free, then we want to obey these. And we see this really as important into how it is that we are to love God. And if we were to be honest this morning, this should be our highest aim, that we should resonate deeply this morning if you are a Christian with Jesus' acknowledgement and even direction that our highest aim should be to love the Lord God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. And this is the great and first commandment. And so we're going to look at the Ten Commandments. going to break it up according to the two sections. That is, how is it that we are to love God? So that's the question. How is it that we are to love God? Verses 1 through 11. 
And then the conclusion of this, all the way through verse 20, excuse me, 21, next week, how is it that we are to love neighbor? So how do we love God? Let's just look at the beginning of this, and then starting verse 3, but jump up to verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But, verse 6, showing steadfast love to, the, to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord God, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The first thing that you note, as I said earlier, is that what's the preamble to this? Before we look at the imperatives, the commands that are issued at Mount Sinai, we have to be struck again by this preamble of grace. In verses 1 and 2, just think about this for just a second. From the very voice of God himself to the people of God, these words come, and God spoke all these words saying, here it is, verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It cannot be overstated that unless we are gripped by the grace of God in his redeeming work, we will never apply the word of God and the commands of God appropriately. What God does at the very beginning of this before he issues the demands, he issues ethical treatment and sorry, orientation of life, is he reminds his audience of how wonderful his grace is. And so before we go much further, before we sort of get into the meat of how it is that you and I are to love God appropriately, clearly, have you been gripped by God's redeeming grace? Have you been brought, if you will, have you experienced a greater exodus? Because it's hard for us, right? We, we, we love our autonomy. We, are sort of, we, we, we love our freedom. And one of the things that's really hard for most people in the West, specifically America, is to actually understand the depth of their depravity, the depth of their bondage outside of Christ, to then revel in what God calls us to do. And what I would suggest to you this morning is if you are a Christian, you are a Christian supremely because of God's grace in your life. And if you're not a Christian, you need to understand that God has already done the most gracious thing that could ever be done is that he sent his son to die for you. And you must submit and even receive his grace. But this grace, notice a few things that he reminds them of and reminds us of. First of all, we see the grace of his liberating power out of bondage by his grace. Do you notice what he says? Who brought you out of the land of Egypt? Now, we know up to this point that, that they have been brought out of Egypt, that God has showed up in miraculous ways throughout the story. He has fed them manna from heaven. He has provided meat. Their sandals have not worn out. You have probably close to a million people who are sojourning and as pilgrims through the wilderness, and God continues to show up. It wasn't only his grace of liberating them from Egypt bondage, but it was his grace of providing for them in the wilderness. So we see and know that the story of redemption is about his grace. That if you understand this, that God alone liberates you from the punishment that you deserve. That in our sinfulness and in our rebellion, we deserve punishment. We are bound by our sin, but because of his grace, we get to go free. Now, how many of you love freedom? Okay, that was not a good answer. <laughs> How many of you love freedom? And we love the freedoms that we enjoy here. But may I suggest to you, church, that there is a greater freedom? There is a freedom from the penalty of our sin. There is a freedom from the bondage and dominion of sin. 
And that freedom should, listen, it should grip our lives. It is more precious. It is most glorious. And he celebrates this liberating power. Not only that, we see in this text the grace of our union with him. Brought out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then at the very beginning, he says, I am the Lord your God. I'm the Lord your God. He is giving actually overtones to what was, we noted in chapter 19, is that by his grace, not only are we set free from sin, set free from bondage, but we get to know him. We get to know him. You know, I grew up in the church thinking that it was just, you know, it's just this sort of thing. If I just go to church, if I do good Christian ethics, you know, if I, if I just get into the Christian subculture, then I'm good. And over and over and over again in covenant loyalty and covenant language, what we see about his grace is that not only are we set free, but we're brought near to him. We're brought to him on eagle's wings. That we get to know him. You see, it's his liberating power out of bondage. It's also the grace of our union with him by, bringing not, by him being our Lord and we are his people. We get this grace of knowing him. You see, if you're saved, if you're a Christian this morning, you have experienced a greater exodus. You're united to God through faith in Jesus and you have a new purpose in this world. We are priests and priestesses in his kingdom and it's all because of his grace. And when this is a reality, increasingly so, your identity, your amazement of God's grace in your life, then you go, as we said a couple of weeks ago, you go from Mount Sinai to where the law crushes us. We see it's our inability to keep these. Then when we get to Calvary, we see Jesus, the one who kept all of these, and he would even say he came to fulfill the law, and then he died for lawbreakers. And when you stand amazed at Mount Calvary of who Jesus is, it's then when we go back to Sinai and we say yes. We say yes. These are good and right. You will see the law as a good orientation of your life when you marvel, when you are, when you are changed by his grace. You will not see these as restrictive in the sense of some killjoy giving us some demands that would seek to restrict us or harm us. But rather, you will see in these commands, this is how I love my sovereign, and this is how I love my neighbor. This is how we do this. So, we need a new heart, don't we? Before we even think about taking notes, can I remind you that every one of us are, we are not able to keep these demands apart from his grace. You can't do it. You can't do it. And so we need descending grace. We need a new heart. And then we say, yes, this is how I love him. So, and then we see these wonderful instructions of, first of all, how is it that we are to love God? And I would suggest to you that the first commandment, simply could be summarized this way, is that we are to love God by worshiping Him alone. Verse 3, notice, most of these are stated in the negative, but they have wonderful positive results. He says, you shall have no other gods before me, or literally, there shall not be for you other gods before my face. What God is doing in these instructions is simply saying to a redeemed people, if you're going to love me, then you must have an exclusive allegiance to me. This is a good summary of this first commandment. And if you think about the context of this for just a moment, think about where they just came from. Think about the, the pagan world around them. Egyptian polytheism, meaning multiple gods, idols everywhere. A god for this, a god for that, a god for this. Polytheism is this idea is that there are multiple deities and what God is saying and how is it that we are to love him is that our allegiance is to be exclusive to him. That Israel and Hope Church is to be the torch of monotheism. In other words, don't miss this, in a world of multiple gods, Israel and Hope Church is to worship the true and living God exclusively. We are not embarrassed about this. 
We shall have no other gods before me. Now think about this for just a moment. Written by the very finger of God himself on the stone tablets, God is actually demanding allegiance. He's demanding it. It's a way of saying this in that context. Pharaoh is not God. Yahweh is God. He alone is the sole sovereign. And actually, all the evidence, if you just follow the storyline up to chapter 20, guess what's happening? The power and presence of God is actually supporting, it's underpinning this claim. Think about it. Think about all the way back to the plagues. What's happening? God is showing that he will have no rivals. There are no rivals. And then when it comes to how is it that we're to love him, he simply is pointing out that we are to worship him alone. All the evidence is pointing to actually the legitimacy of the demand. How is it that covenant people are to love God supremely by worshiping him alone? He is our highest good. He is the only one who is real and alive. So we love him by having allegiance to him. Question this morning. What is your highest allegiance? Who is your highest allegiance given to? Yourself? Or do you live and breathe in a sense of you alone are my God? You alone are my sovereign. How are we going to love him more deeply? Right now, today, we have to say he has no rivals. He is my highest good. I am committed to him. Have you signed a blank check? He is not a God among many. He is the only true and living God. We worship him alone. Secondly, though, in verses 4 through 6, how is it that we love him not only by this exclusive allegiance, but we worship him accordingly. So it moves from just a, this exclusivity to now worshiping him properly. This is why there, in verses 4, 5, and 6, there's more meat given to this commandment. The second commandment, notice, you shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. It goes back to a creation consideration. That what, what, what is now happening is we move from, in the first commandment, to this issue of allegiance, now to the idea of appropriate worship. That we are to love him by rejecting counterfeits. All counterfeits. The pure and proper worship of Yahweh rejects icons, forms, and cheap substitutes. The worship of Jesus Christ right now in the 21st century rejects all cheap substitutes. You see, the people of the ancient Near East were famous for crafting images and icons to highlight their devotion to their gods. This actually was even in Paul's day. You can see this in the book of Acts where both polytheism and idolatry, this crafting of images and icons was was popular within the ancient world. That men and women were the type of people who revered magical type images that they crafted by their own hands. And what we see over and over and over again, though, is that idols were lifeless and powerless. All of the Bible points us to that any cheap substitute has no power. And I would suggest to you, though, when you think about the second commandment, in the context of the the first hearer's day, We're not very far off even today. Now, it manifests itself differently, doesn't it? You see, idolatry is not just something that plagued the ancient world. Idolatry plagues the contemporary world, doesn't it? Our world is full of idols. A good friend of mine years ago said, Jamie, even our hearts can be idol factories. Idol factories. Do you agree with that? Tim Keller has written a wonderful book I would suggest to you. It's called Counterfeit Gods, I believe is the title. And in that book, Keller says this, We may not kneel before the statue of Aphrodite, 
But many young women today are driven into depression and eating disorders by an obsessive concern over their body image. We may not actually burn incense to Artemis, but when money and career are raised to cosmic proportions, we perform a type of child sacrifice, neglecting family and community to achieve a higher place in business and gain more wealth and prestige. You see, what, the right, what God is doing is in essence saying to turn creation and the created into objects of devotion is idolatry. He uses different spheres of the created order to show us in the negative that it is wrong to take lesser things and make them ultimate things. And when we do that, we are guilty of idolatry. You see, we are to have dominion over creation. We are to steward creation well and to find enjoyment in creation. We are not to turn lesser things again into ultimate things. And I would suggest that although we may not have icons or images or replacements in our culture, excuse me, those type of physical structures, we do turn very regularly lesser things into ultimate things, don't we? And when we do this, we cease to love him supremely and move to admiring him. Make no mistake about it that everyone under the sound of my voice, myself included, our hearts can today be idol factories. One of the things that God has done in my life over the years, and I, I, so I'm, a, I'm still in the middle of my own sanctification, okay? So just a moment of confession, but God will often reveal to me that what I get angry over is actually often my supreme love. And it can be crushing. I don't have to be in the Sinai Peninsula to realize that idolatry is still a, a temptation in life. So do we have contemporary idols today that we need to crush? May I suggest to you four, four contemporary idols that need to be crushed. Number one, money, greed. We'll go through these pretty quickly. Gold is a cheap substitute for glory. Secondly, here's a contemporary idol, power. Control is a cheap substitute for servanthood. Sex is a cheap substitute for intimacy. Here's one that I think is very popular. This idea of gender autonomy. Confusion found in the LGBTQ plus movement is a cheap substitute for heterosexual, biological, compatible monogamy. Instead of appreciating gender distinctives today between male and female, we actually try to normalize and call good that which is evil. The current push for gender plasticity and the attempt to erode fixed biological norms is the created playing the creator. It reveals to us an incessant defiance of man's love for his own autonomy and a violent refusal of God's sovereignty. You see, if we're going to love God supremely, we have to worship Him accordingly. We must reject all cheap substitutes. And notice how this second commandment is punctuated. Don't, list, don't miss this. It's punctuated in verses 5 and 6. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. But why? Why, why does He give this, this instruction? Don't miss this. For, He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And now he offers a warning. So we see his character. God's ambitious for that which is actually good for us. Make no mistake about it. People will turn these things that I've just said on their head and they will suggest to us that biblical fidelity to these areas is actually evil. And when God says he's jealous, he's not an egomaniac trying to wreck the world or wreck your life. He wants the best for us in Christ. This is why he's jealous. And then there's a warning, though. Notice, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So there's a warning of consequences that are not, by the way, just individual consequences. There's corporate 
problems because of sinfulness and idolatry. It's not just you are harmed. We harm one another. And there's a generational note. So we see the warning, but here we see the beauty of his grace, the promise. Notice verse 6. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep his commandments. Now let's just be honest. Good Bible students. Which part of that grounding, that verses 5 and 6, do you really want? Right? I mean, think about it for just a moment. What do you want? His great, look, but showing steadfast love. It's this infinite note that struck. I I love the comparison. Three and four generations, consequences of rebellion because of this idolatry, making, crafting our own gods, and yet he graciously reminds us. He graciously reminds us of his infinite grace. This is what we receive. We see this. And so when you think about how he grounds this quickly, he grounds this commandment to to not craft images, to not create idols in his character. He, he, He grounds it in consequences of idolatry, the warnings, and he grounds it in his limitless loving kindness. All of this should add contours to us worshiping him rightly. We need to be reminded of his character and of his ambition. We need to be reminded of how our sin affects one another. And we need to be reminded of his love towards us, that covenant loyalty is the best play. And so what should our prayer be this morning when we think about contemporary idols and how this is grounded? Here's my prayer, is that we would have the experience of the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians, where Paul writes that it was evident in chapter 1 that they had turned from idols to the living God. That's what Paul, When Paul knows about the testimony of this church in the ancient world, he says and writes that they turned from idols. I wonder this morning, as we think about right here in, in where you sit, if God would not be pleased... And Christ exalted. If you said, I'm an idolater. And you crushed them today. And said, no, I want you as my highest good. And I reject all cheap substitutes. And so here's my prayer. What if today the greedy turned to being generous. And started giving more than taking. What if the powerful turned to a lifestyle of quiet, quiet, simple servanthood? What if the wondering eye turned from looking at the opposite sex as a means of gratifying the flesh to respect and dignity? What if today the gay or lesbian turned to actually affirming their maleness and femaleness and the creative dignity of a complementary lifestyle? What if that is what the world saw? That the power of the gospel was so rich and full that people turned from idolatry and began to worship the true and living God and said in that stream, we reject all cheap substitutes. We reject them. What a great day that would be, wouldn't it? And so we have to understand, how is it that we love him quickly? We worship him alone. We have to worship him accordingly. Thirdly, we have to live for him publicly. This is how we love him. We have to live for him publicly. Notice verse 7. The third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You see, to love God supremely is to honor him with both our life and our lips. You see, this command though, it's important, it's just so helpful this week. Just re Studying this and thinking, trying to give just concentrated thought to what is, what is God demanding here of us? I would suggest to you that our lips matter. What we say matters. Words matter. But in the ancient Near East, a name meant something. It meant something. It had great gravity and great both appeal or disdain. 
In the ancient world, a name meant something. And what God is demanding here is that the idea for us to love him goes beyond just the use of language to actually how we live. So it goes beyond cursing in the public square to actually what what Jesus would teach us to pray. Hallowed be your name. Yeah, kingdom come, right? It has this idea of reputation. This is what's at play here. And boy, have we forgotten this. We, we break this commandment very regularly as God's people. And it's not only by our language, but I would suggest to you it's by how we bear his name in public. And what God is teaching us is that if we say we love God, love Jesus, how we live in public matters. How we live in public matters. I remember when the boys were smaller, I typically drop them off at school. And as they would get out of the car or the truck, whatever I was driving, one day I was hoping it would be a moped at one point, but that, by the, sorry, that was not in the notes. Um, I would often tell them, hey guys, remember, you represent the Lord, you represent your family, and you represent your church. Have a great day. Now, they're sinners just like me, okay? Um, No one in this room is perfect. Now, I have the privilege with Ellie. And so, I'll take Ellie regularly. I didn't hold the boy's hand. I'm holding her hand. So, you're getting more than what was prepared. So, typically or regularly, we're holding hands. Sometimes, I'll say, hey, pray for... It's just, it's a great six minutes. And occasionally, I'll say to her, hey, Ellie, remember... You represent the Lord, you represent your family, and you represent your church. And I I don't want for either my boys or Ellie or me or you to crush under the weight of that responsibility because only grace can empower us to live that way. But what I will say, and I think what needs to be heard, is that if we continue to say to the world in the community, and we bear the name Christian, and we are not concerned about the reputation that we create or have in our workplaces, our homes, our neighborhoods, and our community, we are breaking God's commands, commands specifically. How we live in public matters. How we live in public matters. We have to understand this, that we are to bear the name of God everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. This is how we seek to love him. For the sake of time, we'll deal with the fourth commandment next week. But can I just ask you this question as we seek to close? Are you in any measure guilty of breaking these commands? If so, here's the resolve. Here's the resolve. There was one who came to fulfill these commands and he did so perfectly. This is why it's not only the work of Jesus that matters, but it's the person of Jesus that matters. That in faith, you don't, not only do you get accredited what he did on the cross, but you get also to your credit his life. You get the righteousness of Christ. And so when I look at these commands, there's a measure of weightiness, right? How can I do this? I'm a lawbreaker. Here's the fact, is that in Christ, we have one who kept the law for us. We get his righteousness. And then when you realize, even this moment, in this morning, this morning, that you have broken, maybe are breaking these commands. Not only do we get his righteousness, but we get what he's purchased, what he paid for. That by faith, I actually get to go free from the guilt of this because of what Jesus purchased for me. That he died for lawbreakers. That he died in my place. And so here's the answer and here's the resolve to loving him. It is all about Jesus because he's the only one who can live up to these and he is the only one who can empower us
to follow suit, to say yes to these commands. Do you love him? If not, what a great day it would be to say for maybe the first time, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Or maybe, just maybe, in your own sanctification, you would say, I have drifted so far into idolatry that I need to crush these idols in my life today and love him more supremely. What a great day that would be. What a glorious, what a glorious experience that would be for you. This is the opportunity that you have. And so as our team comes this morning and as we get ready to sing, would you just pray with me for just a moment? Would you just right there in, the, in your seat, just in the quietness of the moment, not waste this time, but just say, Simply acknowledge your need of His grace. That you need descending grace in your life. Maybe you feel so numb and so distant. You're just going through the emotions. And maybe you realize for the first time in a long time that you need grace. You need God's grace to you. It's available. Just receive it. Trust Him. Maybe you're an unbeliever. And you sort of look at these and you're like, I'm pretty good at those things. I'm a good moral person. I'm a good moral lady. I'm a good moral guy. I mean, I don't, I don't cheat. Maybe what you need to be saved from this morning is self-righteousness. And that today, by faith, you trust him. You receive him. And you follow him the rest of your days. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for how you lead us. Thank you for how you continue to teach us and mold us. We acknowledge this morning, Lord, that that our greatest enemy is truly pride. And that our greatest friend is grace. It's humility and grace. So, Lord, we just seek you this morning. We, we pray that these moments wouldn't pass us by. That, Holy Spirit, you would take your word. You would give life. You'd give encouragement. You'd give conviction. And that our resolve this morning would be on Jesus Christ, who kept the law for us. Who was perfect in every way. And then who died for lawbreakers. Would you raise our affections for Jesus Christ this morning? For it's in his name we pray. Amen.